Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Pregnant and Postpartum Essential Workers in the Time of COVID-19. My name is Paige Bellenbaum, and I'm the founding director of the Motherhood Center. I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this, this webinar will be recorded, and it will be up on our website later this week. In the event that you missed part of it or you'd like to forward it to someone you know that might find it helpful or watch it again. Uh, before I introduce you to our presenters today, I just wanted to uh, let you all know a little bit about who we are at the Motherhood Center and what we do. We are the first of its kind treatment facility uh, for new and expecting mothers that are experiencing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. The acronym for that is PMADS. Most people recognize it as postpartum depression. So we specialize in providing clinical care um, to new and expecting moms that are having a really difficult time with the challenges of transitioning to motherhood and are experiencing depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, OCD, PTSD, a whole number of, of symptoms and diagnoses that fall under the PMAD umbrella. Um, we are noticing much higher rates of anxiety right now due to everything that's going on um, with the pandemic and just strongly encourage you or if someone you know appears to be struggling during this time in the perinatal period, please feel free to, to, to tell them to give us a call or, or visit our website, which will be available at the end. Um, we provide individual therapy, medication management. We have a day program for new and expecting moms that are having a very challenging time with this transition that provides clinical care five hours a day, five days a week. We also have uh, many support groups for pregnant women, new mothers, uh, partners and fathers, uh, and we have a, a very rich series of webinars just like this one that specialize on um, different issues as they relate to pregnant and new moms um, trying to make the transition and, and also dealing with all of the, the challenges and struggles that come up um, during this coronavirus time. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce you to our very special panelists today. And I just want to encourage all of you who are watching, if you do have a question, um, feel free to type it into the chat um, and we'll get to it either midway through or at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Albertini. She is a supervising attending psychiatrist specializing in evaluation and treatment of mental illness in medically ill patients. She has a special focus in the comprehensive care of women and their families during fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, pregnancy loss, and perimenopause, menopausal. Dr. Albertini completed her undergraduate education at Princeton University and her medical training at SUNY Downstate College of Medicine. After four years of residency, training in psychiatry at NYU Lango Medical Center and Bellevue Hospital, Dr. Albertini did an additional postgraduate fellowship in consult liaison psychiatry at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. She most recently served as assistant professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai, where she took an active role in education of medical students, residents, and fellows. In addition to her inpatient duties, she started a consultation service embedded in the outpatient obstetrics clinic for treatment of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Uh, and also just want to add that uh, Dr. Albertini, I'm very proud to say, um, is an active reproductive psychiatrist with us at the Motherhood Center. I'd also like to introduce to you Zareen Patel. She is a postdoctoral fellow in clinical psychology. Dr. Patel received her PhD in clinical psychology with a health emphasis from Kurkoff Graduate School of Psychology at Yeshiva University. She completed her clinical internship at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Throughout graduate school, Dr. Patel trained with a variety of inpatient, outpatient, and community-based settings at New York Presbyterian and, Mar and Montefiore Medical Center. Her clinical and research activities primarily focused on treating women with chronic illnesses and comorbid psychiatric conditions. She's passionate about providing comprehensive and holistic mental health services to perinatal women. Prior to graduate school, Dr. Patel worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the Department of Medicine and volunteered for five years in the Department of Pediatrics at MSK. She is also a psychologist, a postdoctoral psychologist with us at the Motherhood Center. So I just want to welcome you both so very much and thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, inform us on this very important topic. All right. 
Thank you so much, Paige. So um, again, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Albertini. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm working at the Motherhood Center. And today, Dr. Patel and I are going to be talking to you about pregnant and postpartum essential workers during the time of COVID-19. And as you guys can sort of imagine and understand that this is an ever evolving sort of topic. And, you know, as we go through this, even just over the past few days, there, there's more information that might be added. So um, this might, some of these discussion topics might change sort of in, in the weeks to come and we welcome, you know, people's questions and any, any feedback that they have as a re regards to that. So, uh, slide. Can I get this next slide? Can I get the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, today, you know, we, we really thought that it was important to focus on essential workers since, you know, these are a population of workers who have been going in um, despite the fact that most people are staying at home at the moment. Um, and as we sort of start to move towards reintegrating some non-essential workers back into the workforce. I think some of the, the topics that we're discussing today are going to be really applicable um, for those that population as well. But for now, we are, we are talking about essential workers um, because they're really a unique um, discussion of topics about uh, managing acute distress while also continuing professional roles within the community. Slide. So one in three jobs held by women have been designated as essential. Um, that, that was a quote from the New York Times, and I think it just sort of goes to say how many women are currently um, out there in the workforce sort of managing um, both at home, um, oftentimes with, with small children um, at home, and then also sort of needing to go into the workplace as well. Slide. All right. So, so who are essential workers? You know, right now it is a much wider scope than I think a lot of people fully recognize. So this can be, you know, people who work in the public transportation uh, department, um, people who work in grocery stores or delivery workers, restaurant workers, um, also flight attendants. You know, although many flights are sort of grounded currently, there's still a lot of individuals who are going into work and spending many hours in, you know, constrained areas with people that they have unknown risk. Um, law enforcement officers, I think this is a very big group of people to sort of talk about, and then also healthcare workers. Um, and this includes both, you know, doctors and nurses, but then other people that we sort of often overlook in the healthcare industry, um, but pharmacists, facility staff, um, I didn't specifically write here EMTs, but sort of other people that are out there and active um, and, and interfacing both with, you know, potentially with patients, but then also with other people in the community and really um, are still sort of deemed essential at this time. Slide. Um, so when we're, we're talking about um, these essential workers and sort of what it means to potentially be pregnant or to have small children at home. Um, I think there are a few issues that come up that are really unique to this, this population that those of, um, people who are able to shelter in place don't necessarily um, experience in the same way. And so they might be displaying their own set of anxieties and worries at home, but people who are forced to go into the community and interact with either known or unknown cases, um, people who have, have COVID-19, I mean, I think they, they come up with this whole other set of potential issues that arise. So, I mean, I think one of the biggest ones is sort of how do we protect ourselves from an unknown threat, right? The, as more and more is understood about COVID, I think the threat is sort of more understandable, but especially in the beginning, but even now, um, there's still a lot that we, we don't know about this illness and um, what it means to expose oneself to that. 
I think for, for pregnant women, um, this becomes even more sort of troubling because we have such little data um, to understand the implications of the virus on the neonate. I mean, the, the virus itself has only been around for a few, few months and gestation is nine months. So, you know, we have no data um, to say what it means in, you know, first and second trimester um, to have a mother exposed. And I think that can be really, really scary and worrisome for anybody who's pregnant. Um, and so this sort of how, how then do you go about and, and functioning in the world with sort of un, unlimited, un, unknown resources and sort of understanding of, of what that means and what the actual um, risk is to yourself and, and to the, the neonate. Um, I think another issue that a lot of people are facing, and this is happening in the healthcare industry, but in many other areas um, of government, um, sort of run industries, I, I've seen it a lot, but I think it's happening throughout um, all industries, is that people are getting redeployed into new areas of their job. So, you know, somebody maybe is used to working in one office setting or one hospital setting or what, wherever their, their primary employment is. And then as COVID has sort of changed the the workplace and sort of what the needs are within the community the, the jobs of individuals has really changed and so what what comes up in that and sort of suddenly not only being in this really stressful environment but then also trying to sort of start a new job at the same time um, there are also a lot of individuals who have chosen because of such unknown risks and some of the risks that we do know about to potentially separate from their families during this time and what that means um, to, to the psyche of, of the individual, right? And the sort of how, how do we deal with that both in terms of being a parent, um, but then also being an individual and being alone and then also sort of trying to balance out those needs, um, which really brings me to the next sort of area that is sort of coming up, which is this, this balance of how, how do we have our duty to our hospital or our employers versus the the duty to oneself and one's family? And you know these these are parts of one's identity and um, that are typically sort of in in a balance, right? We we've figured these things out as we've developed sort of what our roles are at home, our roles are at work, and we can find a balance. But now it's really sort of turned itself on its head during during this time. Um, and so how do, how do people find that balance? Slide. So, you know, with, with all of these issues that I've sort of brought up and sort of what this new work environment looks like, as you can imagine, there is going to be a lot of emotional distress that occurs as a result of these issues. Slide. I really like this quote by uh, Craig Katz, who is a, a psychiatrist at Mount Sinai, where I used to work. And he is sort of a specialist in global mental health, but really talks a lot about trauma. And he said that just like we need to take extra precautions to protect ourselves from being infected by COVID-19, we also need to be aware of the psychological risks facing healthcare workers. Um, I think that that sums it up really nicely. You know, initially there was a lot of discussion about sort of how do we protect ourselves from the illness itself. Um, but as we've sort of moved through some of that and some people have sort of processed what that looks like, you know, we're, we're really realizing the, the mental health impact of this disease and not only on people who acquired the disease, but on everybody else um, and sort of the, the fear of developing the disease um, and what that means specifically for people who are essential workers and cannot fully protect themselves by having no contact. Um, you know, this, is, this really becomes a, a big topic of discussion. Slide. So what are some of the sort of signs of emotional distress that people might see? So, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the sort of discussions of burnout, which is really common now to talk about within the medical community, but common within many other industries as well, and sort of talked about with workers is um, sort of this not sort of a 
if we think about disease being sort of on, on a spectrum, right? So we haven't moved into somebody necessarily being diagnosed as having major depressive disorder or PTSD, but they are sort of getting these signs of burnout, which is a non-clinical diagnosis. Um, and, and what does that look like? So this is just a summary from the, the Center for Disease Control, sort of talking about what some of the symptoms might be of burnout. And what this looks like is, you know, sadness or feeling depressed or, or apathetic. Um, some people just feel very easily frustrated and irritable. Some people might feel indifferent and sort of numb or removed from the situation that they're in, which can also cause feelings of isolation or disconnection from other people, in, at, whether it's at home or at work. Um, you know, this can extend then to things like feeling tired or exhausted or overwhelmed, really neglecting self-care and hygiene. Um, and then starting to become more pathological um, and sort of feeling like a failure, nothing you can do to sort of help or start having poor work performance, and then also starting to reach towards things like alcohol or other drugs to cope. Um, so what, what we know from other mental health or from other disasters, um, whether it's a hurricane or war or sort of any other thing that's been researched sort of prior to COVID-19 is that mental health is inevitably the, the largest um, impact of any of these disasters that lasts a quite long time after the, the sort of the initial trauma is over. And so what we see is increased rates of major depressive disorder, um, clearly increased rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is quite expected. And then also an increased risk of alcohol and other drug use, um, as well as just a reappearance for people who maybe had these diagnoses before um, in terms of just a reemergence of a lot of their symptoms. Um, even within COVID, we're starting to get some research on this topic and um, looking at places like China or Italy who had COVID earlier and sort of seeing higher incidences um, of anxiety and depression and insomnia coming out of those populations. Slide. I think something else that is really interesting and is very relevant, uh, uh, right now is this idea of a secondary traumatic stress. And this is, you know, normally when we talk about traumatic stress disorder, we talk about the individual experiencing the, the event themselves or like a close family member or loved one experiencing it. But I think what we see now as this idea that as a healthcare worker, right, you yourself might not be in the experience where you're seeing somebody uh, where, where you yourself are risking fear for your life, but just in seeing sort of other individuals go through that, we can really have this, this secondary traumatic stress that um, occurs as a result of it. So um, sort of as just to understand what the symptoms might look like of that is um, sort of excessive worry or fear about something bad happening, right? If you're seeing all these people around you having these things really terribly happen to them, like what does that impact on you and your sense of um, how, how something might affect you? Um, being easily startled or on guard all the time. So this hypervigilance that you might also see in PTSD, um, these physical signs of stress, so like racing heart, anxiety, other, other physical phenomena, um, and then things like nightmares or recurrent thoughts about a traumatic situation, um, and then sort of feeling like the other person's trauma is actually your trauma, right? So even in just hearing people's stories, so, you know, I think that within health, you know, or other things, like EMT workers, anybody who's sort of out in the front lines, like they might see things themselves, but then also be talking to somebody else who maybe had a, you know, their, their colleague who had a really hard day and they're talking about their traumatic experience. And because they're so closely related in terms of what, you know, their, the two different people's experience are, it sort of conflates and becomes just another um, sense that the other person's trauma actually feels like your trauma. Mm -hmm. Slide. 
So in, in sort of speaking about these, you know, I've been talking generally, but I think we keep on coming back to healthcare workers because healthcare workers, um, not only are they on the front lines and sort of treating patients right now who have COVID, but also I think that because there's so much research that healthcare workers themselves do, a lot of the research that we have right now and sort of discussion is about the healthcare workers. But I think that really we can be applying a lot of these things to the general population and anybody who's out in the front lines. Um, and that being said, you know, I do want to sort of just focus on one or two things that I, I do think are sort of special about healthcare workers and maybe make them even more vulnerable to some of these feelings and, and conflicts. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, I'll just run through a few of those. So, you know, in, in the healthcare industry and for doctors and nurses and sort of all these people who um, have really dedicated their lives towards a service. Um, it's really about sort of helping others. Mm -hmm. And I think when we start to prioritize other people's um, lives in front of our own, some of these um, conflicts, sort of internal conflicts sometimes come up um, and makes it really difficult for our people to start requesting additional support for themselves, right? So, I mean, if you're always somebody who gives to others, right, that just doesn't necessarily come naturally to you. And so I think that is definitely one of, you know, the, the difficulties. And, you know, I definitely saw this in many of my years working in the hospital, but that, you know, individuals have a really, really difficult time and sort of taking a step for a second back and saying like, you know, it's okay, I can sort of, I don't need to help everybody to, the very extent of my ability all the time, sometimes taking a step back and taking care of myself is actually an important part of having the energy and capacity to really treat others. Um, some other things that come up within the healthcare industry um, is just really a lack of time, right? And I think this is happening with essential workers and even with people who are non-essential workers right now. It's just this lack of time. And like, you know, if you are now being expected to do homeschooling for your kids and then also work and sort of not having any additional supports, you know, how are you supposed to find time to then go start seeing a therapist, right? Or sort of calling a friend, uh, you know, what, whatever sort of things that you might want to do in order to help yourself. And there's also um, a difficulty sometimes acknowledging or recognizing um, healthcare workers' own needs, right? Again, sort of this idea that they are not invincible and they can't keep on just going out and doing, doing, doing for everybody else that at a certain time they need to take a step back and really focus on their own needs. And there's also still, especially in some areas of medicine, the sort of stigma around mental health. And, you know, it's, it's really a shame. And you think that we would have moved beyond this at this point, but there are many individuals who really find that they would feel embarrassed or sort of like they weren't sort of able to, to cope um, and well enough um, and that they wouldn't want to talk to others about the, the difficulties that they're having. I mean, I think this sort of goes into this next sort of idea, which is this fear of being even removed from duties during crisis. So, and I'm sure that many people have heard about these really unfortunate suicides that have happened um, within the past month or so within the healthcare industry and also one in the EMT. Um, but this idea that then as a consequence of this, like if you were to then go ask your you know, tell somebody that you were having a difficult time, right? Would they be so worried about you that they might actually remove you from your position because they didn't want something like that to happen? Um, and how do we, you know, sort of find that balance between sort of allowing individuals to be able to speak about sort of the difficulties that they're having without this, this fear of being asked to, to take a leave? Um, so with that, you know, I, I think we I brought up a lot of issues that about sort of workers overall and some of the conflicts that they have, but it's really important to talk about prevention and treatment. And so I'm gonna turn the conversation over to Dr. Patel, who is going to talk to you about those two very important topics. Thank you. Uh, slide, please. 
Um, so I, I just wanted to take a minute to reiterate what Dr. Albertini had said at the beginning and to, to, to share how honored we are to be here to speak on this topic. And I, I think certainly based on our backgrounds and our experiences currently working with patients, just how important of an area this is to focus on. Um, and I think as an extension to the, that last slide um, that ha had that image of all these different essential workers and um, this, I think really this public sentiment of appreciating all of these people and, and applauding them as heroes. Um, and that re over the weekend, I was reading this article that, that was talking about, yes, and certainly we want to emphasize that, this, that we are all heroes, but that in the article, they talked about that heroes are hurting too and that the heroes are struggling as well. Um, and so in thinking about things like burnout and secondary traumatic stress, as well as either the development of symptoms of depression, anxiety, PTSD, or um, the reemergence for some people, how do we think about preventative steps as well as treatment, which we'll outline. Um, slide, please. So one thing and one, I think, topic that's being talked about a lot right now is resilience. Um, and a, a recent paper that we came across that was looking at resilience specifically in COVID, during COVID-19, um, Dr. Rosenberg in this paper had described uh, resilience in a way that really resonated this idea of the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, tragedy, trauma, and other significant sources of stress. Um, and one thing I really liked about the paper was Resilience can be debated in a lot of ways of sort of how, how people build resilience, but that they emphasize that this is something that can be strengthened with practice um, and that something that's evolving. Uh, and certainly where I think one thing that Dr. Albertini touched on and will continue to touch on is that how this is such a tough time. Part of what's so hard about this time is all of these uncertainties and that we're still in the midst of it. Um, and so this part of, the idea with resilience here is that we're, we're in the beginning phase. We're in the like one foot in front of the other phase right now. And, and how do we um, incorporate resilience in a way that doesn't feel like another added responsibility or task when people are so overwhelmed. Um, and resilience can be is um, highly contextual. It's individualized. What works for some people may not work for others. And it can be thought about from an individual Dr. Patel, it looks like you froze. Hmm. I wonder, Dr. Patel, if there's another place you can move the computer to. Your video is frozen and we can't hear you. We're just gonna give Dr. Patel just a moment. It looks like she might have signed off and perhaps is, is trying to get back on. Um, while we're waiting for Dr. T Patel to come back, um, Dr. Albertini, I, I do have a few questions here, um, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sure, we can, we can go to some questions and take a pause until she gets rebooted. Great. So the first question is, how to navigate finding time to decompress or self-care when there's so many demands at work and then at home with children? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a really big topic. And I know Dr. Patel is going to go into some of the ways to really sort of manage stress um, and, and details about sort of how to do this. But finding the balance between, between the two, I, I think that is a huge problem that everybody is facing, right? Whether they're essential workers or stay at home um, parents right now who are still working remotely, um, you know, I think that finding that balance can be really, really cumbersome. And in some ways, you know, well, I think she might be back, so. Hi, I'm so sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> Can you, my internet went out, but I'm just connected from my phone. So if you can hear me, okay, I'll keep, uh, I'll pick up where we left off. Yeah, that's fine. I will, I'll pause the rest of the answer to that question. We can sort of answer it at the end because I do think that Dr. Patel is going to touch on some of the topics anyway. So I will let you continue. Thank you, Dr. Albertini. And Dr. Patel, can you see the slides okay? 
I can. I was just um, trying to, I can see them okay. I think that should be okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I will, if, if my internet reconnects, I will join from the computer. Um, so, so kind of, I'm, I'm not sure at what point I cut off. Um, it, I think thinking about ways individuals can build or start to build on resilience um, include practicing self-care, uh, prioritizing rest and stress management, which can be really difficult right now. So we also want to speak to and validate that. Um, celebrating individual successes as well as within um, a team and cultivating community. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of, we'll expand on some of these things in the next few slides. Uh, slide please. Okay, so in terms of um, self-care, uh, I know this is another topic in the same way resilience, I think that term gets thrown around a lot, so does self-care uh, at times, but um, I, I think what this can look like for essential workers, it may vary person to person, um, but we, we kind of want to outline some of these and think about how can, how can you build them in into your routines when possible. So the first being um, meeting basic needs. And what I mean by that is being able to eat, drink, and sleep regularly, um, taking breaks when possible, connecting with colleagues. So we'll speak more to this in later slides, but I think one thing that's been coming up, up a lot in the literature we have been able to access and speaking to different people is um, the value in, in connecting with um, different colleagues who may be experiencing similar situations to yourself, um, as well as contacting family, um, respecting differences. And what I mean by that, is we, this was um, something we took from the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress that I thought was really helpful um, in specifically for self-care for essential workers. And what I, what they were describing with that is respecting that some people may want to talk about this more than others. And in the same way, um, asking that other people respect your, your differences. Um, staying updated, meaning within an organization or a hospital, staying updated on the latest developments or things that are being rolling, rolled out because so much is changing day to day right now. Um, limiting media exposure to whatever extent is possible. And I think this is, again, Something that may vary in, by individual, but that um, it, it's checking in to see is this more activating to you than not, um, and honoring your service. So what what the some of the guidelines were referencing, I think, is finding ways to um, reflect on this the calling that you. This is a noble calling. It's really challenging right now, and that it's hard here. This calling is to take care of those who are most in need and finding ways to recognize your own accomplishments as well as those of colleagues. And that can be either formally or informally. Okay, uh, slide please. So in, in terms of stress management, I think one thing we really wanted to emphasize is that um, for essential workers, there's so, so much being asked of you right now. And this is, we certainly, don't want this to feel as though, okay, here's another set of responsibilities or tasks that I have to somehow incorporate. So in the same way that um, we talk about self-care, resilience being um, an individual process and seeing what works for you, I think the same goes for these recommendations. So for some people, exer exercise might feel um, like something they can incorporate. For others, it may or exercise that may come in the form of yoga. Um, some people find a, a lot of value in meditation, but if that, those feel like um, really difficult to incorporate right now. A main thing we want to think about is how do we help um, regulate your nervous system? So people are in really difficult, high pressured situations right now. Um, and what's difficult, I think, is when that stress continues over time, even when you get home or before you go to work. So some of the stress management techniques we talk about a lot in different arms of the motherhood center, but whether the day program or individual work and that are derived from different therapeutic orientations are ways to ground yourself. Um, so that can include soothing your senses. It can be something like taking a warm shower, um, lighting a candle, putting on a scented lotion. And I tried to think of things that might feel like already that you're able to work into your day to day, drink some tea mindfully on your way to work. Um, it, I think really thinking about what something that's not going to feel too overwhelming to incorporate right now. Um, progressive muscle relaxation is another um, really important one that can help when we 
have so much tension and anxiety built up physically. Um, and that has the process of that is tensing different muscle groups, holding them for four or five seconds, and then releasing. Um, there are a lot of different scripts available online, videos you can find that are really helpful. Um, I'm mindful I skipped over breathing exercises. So what I mean by that is um, one that I do a lot with patients is a uh, four, seven, eight breathing exercise, which is holding, um, breathing in and counting for four seconds, holding for four, seven seconds, and then releasing for eight seconds and doing that until you feel calmer. Um, imagery can be helpful to some people. So really conjuring up and thinking about a calming place or spot for you. And um, another thing that is often helpful is sort of engaging our five senses. So can you imagine what it looks like? Can you think about what it might smell like or sound like? Um, can you picture yourself there um, with like a cold lemonade or something that you can imagine like the taste and the smell of? All of those things can be calming to people. Um, and certainly one thing we, wanna, um, we want to uh, reference and think about too is that um, speaking with a counselor or other mental health professional if you're finding that um, this is so you're engaging in some of these things it may feel like you could have added benefit from having someone help you both process what's going on as well as find ways to further incorporate this um, slide please uh, and so we also wanted to spend a little time to think about what could treatment look like um, and so we, we organize this in terms of what could health treatment look like based on specific suggestions for healthcare workers, but certainly these can be applied to um, a variety of, of, I think, essential workers, as well as what can more formalized therapeutic treatment look like. Slide, please. Um, so this is something that is pulled from, um, again, the Center for Disease Control, and that's thinking about what are some um, treatment rec or recommendations that would certainly be woven into more formalized treatment as well for healthcare workers, given that they face a high risk or a greater risk of exposure, extreme workloads, um, moral dilemmas, and, and certainly a rapidly evolving practice environment. Um, and I think in this is certainly something we um, are open to discussing as well, but thinking about what on this list feels realistic, what feels like you could integrate. Um, so they recommend limiting work hours to no longer than 12 hour shifts, um, working in teams, uh, writing in a journal, talking to family and friends and supervisors about how you're feeling and your experience so that there's um, power in, in sharing your experience, identifying how you're feeling, um, practicing breathing and relaxation techniques, which we talked about, um, maintaining a healthy diet uh, and getting enough sleep and exercise. Um, I think this goes back to something we were discussing earlier around some of the, the things, the, um, factors they may, that may hold people back from seeking treatment, but knowing that it's okay to draw boundaries and say no sometimes, um, as well as avoiding or limiting caffeine to whatever degree feels possible and the use of alcohol. Slide, please. So, I, you know, I think uh, there are more and more resources that are being rolled out right now, and certainly um, you can start with within organizations, hospitals, employee assistant programs. So I think um, for people who feel like they're maybe trying some of these strategies, they could use some additional support. So what that might look like um, in terms of getting more formalized therapeutic support, um, medication management, um, to start with employee assistant programs within your organization or hospitals. Uh, there are a lot of peer support and buddy type of programs that are coming up that we're hearing about that um, people feel are really beneficial in me talking to someone who can relate in such a, um, a detailed way to your experience. Um, there's something out of Rutgers that's come out called um, Check You, Check To initiative, which is uh, the idea behind that is attending to your own needs first and then checking with two colleagues. Um, there are also increasingly so many uh, virtual offerings that are being done, virtual support groups, virtual therapy, uh, online counseling that is tailored to, to essential workers, whether it's low cost or free, um, as well as parenting specific support. So um, one thing we talked about earlier is just the unique demands on women who are pregnant or who are postpartum. Um, and certainly we, we want 
um, to to in that same vein talk about some of the services here at the motherhood center with, and that were very specialized within that very topic and in, in working with women during pregnancy and postpartum and so um my it's very small on my screen i don't know if someone wouldn't mind just reading out the number for me um and i i should be able to connect back on the computer for the questions yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. This was so helpful. Um, and so uh, to Dr. Patel's point, if you or someone you know might be experiencing a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, um, is either pregnant or postpartum and experiencing any symptoms of anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD, any of those things, uh, please give the Mother Center a call today at 212-335-0034. Um, or you can visit us at www.themotherhoodcenter, all one word, dot com. Um, we've even begun to uh, cross state lines. A lot of states are relaxing the licensing requirements um, so that we're able to treat more women um, in a wider geographic uh, frame, which is, which is wonderful. Um, this was so helpful to the two of you. I want to encourage anybody who is listening right now who might have any questions for Dr. Albertini or Dr. Patel to please enter them into the chat. Um, but I have a couple of other questions here um, that I wanted to ask uh, the both of you. Um, how do you draw the line in terms of distancing from family? It, it, you know, a lot of the clinicians that we have on the team at the Motherhood Center, and I've heard a lot of other stories of, of trying to figure out how to do that the right way. Um, and, and it's so challenging and difficult to be away from your partner and your other family members when you are on the front lines being exposed. How do you draw that line? Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a hard question to sort of answer. And, and clearly everybody is going to be, you know, in a slightly different situation. And Dr. Patel, please chime in if you have anything to add. But, you know, I, I think one of the issues is just sort of talking about like, what does it mean to distance, right? Like I, I'm hearing a lot of different people having very different ways of sort of doing this, right? Whether it's, you know, when they are in the same home, just sort of going into their room and sort of being there and not engaging um, sort of with family members at all, but still sort of being in the physical space with them, um, at least some overlap versus some people who are just completely distant um, and sort of having their loved ones go move in with their, you know, their parents and with the small child for a while so they themselves can continue at work and sort of not have that fear about coming home into that same environment um, while also exposing their, you know, really sort of precious loved ones to whatever it is that they've been exposed to at work. And, and so people really finding different ways of sort of doing this from the beginning. Um, but I, I think so much of it really depends on individual circumstances and sort of fear of that risk and sort of how individuals sort of quantify what they are comfortable with. So I think foremost, we really need to sort of discuss with that person and that family um, sort of what it is that they are fearing versus what they actually want, right? And sort of how do we separate out that anxiety and sort of what is that's driving versus maybe what um, you know, they've sort of processed and are able to confront in terms of actual risk. So I think that is a huge thing to sort of start with. Um, and then figuring out how to then work that into the individual circumstances and, and making sure that everybody in the family really sort of feels comfortable with whatever decision um, is made about, you know, what, what is going to happen. I think also recognizing too that these things are going to change. Mm -hmm. Right. And sort of as the risk of working in different environments changes and as other people start to enter back into the workforce, right, like there might be a shift in what that home environment looks like and, and what it does mean to be separate, um, maybe doesn't feel as important anymore if you, you know, then are allowed to have your child go to a playground again, right? Like maybe some of these things that we're sort of deciding for now are gonna feel different a month from now and sort of recognizing that this is an ever evolving situation um, where we are in ourselves are going to change sort of in terms of what we want and then also what our environment is. 
That's so helpful to hear, Dr. Albertini, because I think so often it's 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 tempting to get caught up in this, oh my gosh, this is how it's always going to be. Like things are never going to get better or change and they are going to get better and they are going to change and we are going to return to some level of normalcy. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. Um, but even now, you know, hearing about different parts of the country opening up and even mm -hmm. upstate New York um, and, and communities that are a little bit closer to us here in New York City, um, it, it does remind us that, that you know, change is, is upon us and what, what we're doing today and what we're practicing today might look different tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just sort of even in terms of the tri-state area, um, different states have different laws um, at this point and places like New Jersey and Connecticut might be shifting um, already in ways that New York City and Westchester are not yet. And so, you know, there are all people that we work with and sort of come together with in, in Manhattan, right? Where everybody sort of comes to for work and now are sort of scattered slightly more in their geographical, like three states and everybody's experiencing it in a different way about how this integration is starting to happen. So I think it's gonna just sort of come up more and more as that continues. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pose a question that we just received from an audience member. With the general lack of true outcome data at this point, any suggestions for resources or ways to cope with thoughtfully making choices that maximize safety without getting to the point of just getting paralyzed by all the details. For example, returning to the healthcare setting, knowing that there are fewer cases, but having to navigate public transportation versus finding alternatives and introducing new routines for decontamination, considering new exposures, et cetera, all feel extremely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Dr. Albertini has to say as well. I was just thinking actually, um, just what an important question that is. And also that as you, um, you're each speaking, I was thinking about how we've talked a lot about like what it's like to be in the midst of this right now, but then what is it also going to look like when things shift again or adjust again? And what, it, what will that be like for people who, who have um, really been on the front lines of this and that there's still room for, for growth, for treatment then too? Um, and, and that it is, it's really hard to, to balance all and feel like you're, you're taking all the information that's out there and making informed decisions that don't feel paralyzing in a lot of ways. Um, and so I'm just thinking a little bit about sort of ways to navigate that. I'm not sure, Dr. Albertini, if you have anything offhand to add. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is sort of constantly as doctors sort of what we're doing and i don't think individuals are always as sort of comfortable with doing it because they're not asked to doing it for themselves all the time but this idea of evaluating risk and, and what that means and sort of how do we take the information in terms of the medical science and sort of what we know and how do we weigh that against anxiety and fear and you know i think one of the things you know is first of all, I'm seeing this come up so much is that people are reading newspapers and sort of getting really like obsessed. This article came out, that article came out. I read this, like I'm supposed to wash all my groceries 400 times before I put them in my cabinet. And like, how many times is enough times and all this kind of, you know, worry that's coming out of the research. And, you know, one thing I remind patients all the time is, you know, if the if newspapers and the media are sort of causing that much anxiety and fear, like stop reading them, right? Let's try to limit our exposure to those areas because a lot of times those newspapers are sensationalizing things, right? Like that's how they get readers is to make things um, a little bit feel more acute and scary and, and people are then going to consume the media more. So I think going back to the source is always sort of my way of, of helping people, right? Let's go back to the CDC. Let's go back to World Health Organization. Let's go back to the actual doctors and scientists and sort of understand more where this information is coming from. And so we can really evaluate what that risk is. And for people who maybe aren't as familiar with doing this themselves or don't know sort of as well how to read a journal article or something, right? Sort of talking to their individual providers, I think is sort of a, always a, a good place to start. And, you know, if you are pregnant or just had a baby, right? Talking to the OB, 
talking to your pediatrician, really getting that information from a medical provider whose job it is to really distill out this information, right? And so that you don't have to feel like you're alone in this and trying to figure it all out for yourself, um, I think is really, really important. Um, the other thing too is, you know, if you do have a therapist or somebody that you're sort of working with, right, to help balance out some of your anxiety and fears, right, those people also can help you work through what it is about um, the particular situation maybe that resonates with you so much uh, in different areas, right? And so some people's fear of illness and sort of exposure to being on the subway maybe feels a little bit more anxiety producing than others or, you know, different environments. So sort of what it is about those places for you and how can we help individuals work through it on a one-to-one -one, um, kind of way. And so that, that would sort of be some, some starting off points that I would think about. I don't know, Dr. Patel, if you had anything to add. I, I was just thinking about that that risk benefit ratio piece mm -hmm. and how how just challenging it is and, I, and to validate that it's really difficult to make sense of all of this and and I like that idea of going back to the sources of the information going back to your providers so that um, you have other people to work through this with so you don't feel I think so many people are feeling alone uh, mm -hmm. with their situations with their circ with circumstances and so to have more, feel as though it's almost like part of a team in, in viewing this and making sense of all of this and then distilling out what, what are, you know, what is it, what's the, is there some meaning behind some of these specific worries and fears that, that it's completely valid, but what does that mean specifically for you? And I think through that team it can include a therapist, your, your medical providers, help, helping to make sense of that. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted, I, I sort of thought of something as you were just saying that, but you know, there are, um, a lot of medical providers and hospitals are actually right now sending out sort of weekly summaries, um, which I think are also really helpful in terms of if you don't necessarily, you know, want to go speak to your individual doctor every week about some of these things, right? And this is ever evolving, right? But sort of signing up for those kinds of newsletters from your providers, you know, I think that doctors overall are aware of the fact that this information is sort of ever changing and people want sort of updates that are a little bit more thoughtful and sort of medically oriented as opposed to sensationalized. And so um, I think that that is something that a lot of people are doing right now. So I think that would also be another great resource for individuals who maybe want to sort of keep up to date on, you know, what to do and in, in terms of what is sort of deemed safe, if not safe, what new topics are that are coming up every week might be. Thank you, both of you. Um, before we end today, I have one more question. Um, and this is about self-advocacy, how to advocate for yourself as a pregnant woman or a mother of small children with organizations and hospitals. I have a couple of clients that are essential workers that are trying to navigate this right now, too. And as I think you you alluded to in the beginning, Dr. Albertini, this is it's sensitive. Um, you know, there has there's there is a fear of retaliation out there. Um, you know, if I if I do ask for special circumstances or if I feel as though I'm putting myself and my family at risk, I'm afraid that if I say something, that something might happen. So, any suggestions either of you have um, uh, to offer our listeners on how to advocate for themselves? I'm, I can answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. No. I'm happy. I, I think we will answer together. I'm happy to jump into. Okay. okay. I mean. Um, so I, I think that this sort of goes back to something that I was just mentioning, which is this idea of sort of processing your own feelings about the situation and sort of what is your internal anxiety um, versus sort of the situation overall. And I think that one thing that I would encourage people to do sort of before thinking about who within their organization to go talk to is to really sort of try to work through for themselves, like what it is that they're worried about and sort of getting to the root of uh, where some of that anxiety lies, right? Because it might just, everything feels overwhelming, right? The whole situation feels overwhelming, but when they really start to like talk it through and distill it, they might find that they're 
there's specific areas that are really hard for them, right? Maybe, maybe it's coming in every other day to work. And then the days that they're home, they're like worried about that exposure, right? So, or maybe it's something more tangible, like how they get to work, um, you know? So everybody has sort of different things, maybe that are points of sort of anxiety and contention that come up. And so we, we can't really address it within our employment situation until we've really addressed it within ourselves. Um, so I think that that is a really big sort of area to, to start with. I'm gonna, well, Dr. Patel, you look like you wanted to add something. Oh, no, I'm in, in agreement. And I was just thinking also about um, just uh, more generally with communication of it may not be that you have a specific request in mind yet, but I think if it may be that it's you're going to speak to someone about feeling overwhelmed and part of it is to, to identify how you're feeling. And, and I think a secondary part may be if this feels appropriate or applicable, what is it that you want to ask for? Is it to work every other day? How do you effectively communicate that? Um, and you know, we, Dr. Albertini, I've been thinking about this question because we we saw it coming up within some of the papers we were reading of people feeling like needing a sense of needing to be heard and protected, um, as well as Paige, you mentioned some of your individual with individual work that this is coming up and fears around that. So um, we were thinking about how how hard of a situation it is to be in that there may be some steps once you do determine how you're feeling what you may want to ask for of whether that's speaking to a supervisor or a trusted colleague um, while also recognizing that each situation may be different some people may feel like that's going to be that's well received um, where others there may be individual complications that certainly i think in a lot of when we think about a lot of these supports and resources that could be talked about and worked through with some, with some additional support yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is just, um, sorry, let me pull myself <laughs> together. There, there, there's so many things to sort of talk about in this topic and, and trying to really get people to feel comfortable within their organizations, right? I mean, I think that there, there really can be um, sort of just a, a fear of what we were talking about with trying to, um, you know, first of all, the stigma around it and sort of what that fear is, but then also what, what it's gonna mean in terms of how people view them um, in the future and whether or not they're going to feel like people are gonna take them out of these really stressful situations because they voiced a concern. Um, and sort of they're gonna be seen like, oh, they can't really handle working in that kind of environment and what how that impacts their, their ongoing career. Um, that being said, I mean, I think that most organizations right now are really trying to be more open and understanding of the psychological implications of what is happening right now. And so, you know, sort of being able to say like, you know, speaking to a supervisor, right? If, if certain things are feeling just really, really hard, um, you know, who within the organization are you supposed to be reporting to? about these things right most most people have a hierarchy already established and so um their supervisor would be the first person to talk to um you know i, I was sort of reminded in this question of this uh paper though that, that we read in the process of this and sort of what different things were that people were asking for within the health environment and sort of what different um ways of sort of advocating for themselves um, and how that came up. And so this article mentioned sort of, and sort of uh, deduced it down to these, to these nice little catchphrases. And I think it really summarizes nicely. So they were sort of hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, and care for me. And I, I think that really sort of outlines what it is that most people are feeling um, and sort of this general sense of like, what, what is it that we need to be providing as organizations for individuals and sort of thinking about it the other way around and sort of not asking the individual to have to go and ask all of these things of their supervisor and their organization overall, but as sort of organizational leaders, how can we be trying to help 
our employees and really advocating for them within this really, really stressful environment um, and, and sort of thinking about it that way and sort of creating programming um, to address all these different areas. Um, and so I think that is, I'm gonna sort of put the onus back on on some of these, these healthcare, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of these huge, employers and um you know the city and for the transportation workers and all these different organizations to really be thinking about you know how how to try to minimize some of the burnout um that we are seeing from all these essential workers and really try to sort of make sure that they're going to be able to sustain themselves for a while because unfortunately this pandemic isn't doesn't seem to be going away and even if people are starting to be integrated back into the workforce somewhat i mean i think this is just going to become more of an issue that that we see amongst all workers as that happens and really needs to be thought about in terms of just how do we help mental health for for everybody during this time well, Dr. Albertini and Dr. Patel, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. This was incredibly informative. Um, and for those of you that are watching, if you joined late and you didn't catch it all, we will have this recorded webinar available by midweek on our website. Um, and I just want to encourage folks again, if you or someone you know is pregnant, postpartum, having a really difficult time transitioning to motherhood, especially in a pandemic, the Motherhood Center is here for you. Um, you can give us a call or visit us online and um, one of our care coordinators um, will help you try to navigate how to get connected to treatment. So thank you both again. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, and please check our website for upcoming webinars. Um, we have a couple more um, in the next few weeks. Um, and we also have recorded all of our past webinars that are also available on our website at www.themotherhoodcenter, all one word, dot com. Thanks again to both of you and thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.